of our studies this year are complementing the theme, which is Old Testament learning for New Covenant living. Everything points to Jesus. It's always been about Him from everlasting to everlasting. And then we see that covenant unfold, and we are living in the time of Christ's covenant now, and it's so beautiful. Even before the holidays, even before the holidays, we began a special series of lessons that, frankly, were good to have as a continuing series. Ideally, once a month, but December kind of affected that, and then the kickoff to the new year. So it's been about two months since we've had another lesson extending our study in prayer. It's only fitting with the theme, though, though, to have a lesson series on prayer based in the Psalms, which are prayers to God. And so far in our series titled, Praying Like the Psalmists, we've learned so much. Sadly, I did not type our review on the screen. I decided to do that just, just really recently. Uh, but we have gone through a lot of studies, and we started with saying it's not a requirement to pray exactly like the psalmists, because we read the language and we admire it. It's so beautiful, and yet sometimes we think that's just not the way I talk or speak. That's okay. That's okay. But we have studied how the psalmists viewed God, and the more we come to understand that relationship with God, the more our prayers and petitions will indeed sound a lot more like theirs. And that's something that we need to consider and be open to. We've also studied how the psalmist viewed God. And how did they view God? Well, they saw him as creator of all, the source of everything, the king over all, the ever-present and the ever-loving shepherd, which is so important. And on that note about shepherd, we saw how the psalmist viewed themselves in relation to God from God's point of view. And we emphasize one word in that lesson, sheep. We are sheep. And frankly, that's not always a compliment. Uh, or I should say that's not very flattering. But God loves us so much. We studied how the psalmist viewed prayer itself. Why did they do it so often? It's because they thought and they knew it was necessary to their sur survival and continuance. It was necessary because it was also beneficial to their life and preservation. It was beneficial, and therefore God heard and did something about it. And if we don't think of prayer the same way, we won't pray the same way. We also studied how, two months ago, how they prepared for prayer. And the summary of that lesson is they meditated on and they molded their lives based off the Word of God. And that is the basic secret to developing in our prayer life. They meditated and molded their lives based on God's word. In this study today, we're focusing on the psalmist's communication with God and how it strengthened the relationship with God. The relationship dynamic is the foundation for the detail of what we'll discuss, but that's the foundation, the relationship with God. And we will see how in every prayer they had only one intent. One intent, no matter the prayer, no matter the petition, it seems like the overarching goal is just one main theme. And we will discuss that today. We will, well, uh, ask ourselves the question, do we presently have the same goal? And if we don't, we will then be challenged to make sure that we open our minds for the resolve and commitment to develop that same goal. How is our relationship with God? That's really the key question. But in the guise of praying like the psalmists, what goal did they have? How did they see their relationship with God? And if I don't have the same goal in my prayers, how's my relationship with God? That's the direction we're taking today. So you've heard it said that you can't have a relationship with someone that you never talk to. Okay. In the same way, we realize that many more things could be shared, but we can't have a relationship a relationship, the one that we're intending, intended to have with God, if we never communicate with him and talk to him in prayer. As was implied by the petition by Larry earlier, it's so important. Before stating that main intent, curious about the title of the lesson, I know, I must first state that their intent for prayer became inseparably linked to their relationship with God. And that relationship dynamic is too important to separate from this. The psalmist's relationship with prayer had developed due to their prayers and their embrace of God's word. And that's the secret. That's the format and the template of communication with God. Our relational dynamic is based in this. 
When we do what they did, we will have the relationship that they had. It first starts with a commitment, and then it develops into character. We study the Word of God, which is His communication with us. We study the Word of God because that is His communication with us. I worry about the heart or the spirit of a person, the soul of an individual who doesn't want to study the Word of God. His communication with us. We also pray to Him. That's our communication to Him and our communication in the context of life itself to emulate the Word of God. And it's that what develops what we mentioned two, Sunday, or two lessons ago in this particular series. So, to have that in mind, the more we do this, the more we uh, get to have the same intent that they did. It starts with a resolve, and we develop into this idea. The question is, what is our intent in prayer? Is it the same as the psalmist's? Well, to have the relationship with God as they did, and to pray to God as they did, we must also decide to develop that resolve to, and here it is, point one, to let everything be, and I mean everything be, to the praise of God's glory. Everything to the praise of God's glory. Obviously, within the Psalms, there are petitions with a variety of requests like deliverance, forgiveness, uh, mercy, preservation, protection, and so on. Even peace of mind and soul and spirit. But those are always secondary to this overarching and overriding intent. If you study the Psalms as a whole, and we're not quite there yet in our Wednesday series, so we haven't had that as a recent reading for everyone. But overall, what is that overshadowing goal? It's the same one that we see stated in Ephesians chapter 1. I try to not go off or out of the context that we're basing the series off of, but last year we studied the New Testament epistles. And this particularly stood out to me. Ephesians chapter 1. This stood out to me in such a way that I said, this is a lot like the Psalms. So I'm finally now linking the two for your benefit. If you wanted to turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and mark these highlights in your Bible the way they are on the screen, feel free. As I read this, uh, we're going to revisit Ephesians 1 chapter 1. Just a few key passages here. Verses 1 through, uh, let's see, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1. Having predestined, that is, predetermined salvation's plan by which we can be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, wow, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Verses 11 and 12. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, as defined earlier, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Verses 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. All of this is to the praise of his glory. So before creation's beginning to eternity's beginning and evermore from everlasting to everlasting, it's all about praising God, glorifying God and the psalmist's knew this as well. The theme of glory to God is naturally evident in the Psalms. And even when they had no other petitions for this, if you take the Psalms and, and, and categorize them, the ones that do nothing but praise God clearly express what they were all about. And Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Psalm 115.1 Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Beautiful. Psalm 146.1 and 2 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Psalm 150, 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. These words may sound familiar to you. We have turned many, uh, well, we have made many songs from these psalms. <laughs> the wording is reflected, and they all reflect life's purpose. What is life's purpose? It is to glorify God. That is life's purpose. Thanks for the amen on that. Point C now. Even in the psalms of the laments and the psalms of desperate prayer for life and deliverance and preservation, protection, all of these still convey that same idea. Psalm 6, 5. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? Now, why in context here, why is he pleading for his life? So that he can continue praising God. Simply put, anyway. Chapter 30, verse 9, Psalm 39. What profit is there in death if I go to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Let it tell of your faithfulness? The implication is, if I live, as long as I live, I will praise the Lord. Psalm 88, 10. Do you work wonders for the dead? The rhetorical implication is no. This is not in context of the resurrection, of course. It's not the, what's happening here. But he then says, referring to the physical grave, do the departed rise up to praise you? N no, so let my preservation praise you. Psalm 115, 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. So in 118, 17, he says, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount I'll continue to speak of the deeds of the Lord. Wow. Psalm 119, 175. Simply put, let my soul live and praise you. Wow. Does that describe your relationship with God? Are you there yet? Are you, are you journeying there? Have you decided to go there? Are you working hard to get there? That no matter what, you are seeking the Lord in any petition, what you ultimately want is to praise and glorify Him. Well, thankfully, the more we communicate with God, the more this goal becomes who we are, but it is something we have to commit to, and it's in the spiritual disciplines we often take for granted. Studying His Word and praying. In this case, we're focusing on those two, steadfast study and sincere in prayer. That's the basic advice. But for this sermon, of course, the next part of it uh, is just going to be a, a little bit more specific. If the sermon really starts now, it'll be really short, right? Step one, how do we accomplish this goal? We know we need it, so how do we do it? Well, simply start by letting everything you do praise God. <laughs> Yes, even in your prayers. And when I say this, I say literally, praise God. For your prayers to praise God, here's an interesting idea, in your prayers, praise God. That's pretty simple and we take it for granted sometimes. Notice how in Matthew chapter 6, the model prayer, beginning at verse 9, starts with praising God. Have you ever noticed that? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. These aren't merely words to begin an official prayer. These are words that must express a sentiment of reverence in your soul. And the Lord sees that heart. Those are good words to adopt. If we're not used to beginning prayers that way, go ahead. That's a good place to start. According to some manuscripts, it also concludes with praise, with the phrase, For your kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For yours is the kingdom forever and ever. That's a beautiful, beautiful phrase, isn't it? So let's make sure that praise is the anchor in our prayers from beginning to end. And if we are not used to praising God in our prayers, let's go ahead and adopt the line from Jesus himself. This is a good line to start, but make sure you don't just speak the words. Let them be an expression of adoration in your soul. Point B, 
Just prioritize as well. Prioritize being concerned about God's will over your own. That's so important. And this keeps us in humble check. I know. I'm thankful that God loves to hear the requests of His children. And that's another dynamic we've preached on many times before, but, but not today as much. Great examples are seen throughout all of Scripture and fresh on my mind because of two weeks ago, the reading of First and Second Kings is the prayer of Hezekiah. The prayer of Hezekiah for the southern kingdom back when Assyria was a conquering power. He prayed for preservation. He prayed in 2 Kings 19, if you wanted to mark that. 2 Kings 19, 15 through 19. Uh, Assyria was, was a conquering threat. And he prayed for preservation. But why? Just for himself? No. Number one, he prayed, which is an amazing feat to focus on the power of prayer. That's exactly what you need to do. But then the essence of his prayer was not for himself. It wasn't for selfish reasons. It was so that the nation would be preserved to the glory of the strength of God's name. And you can read that account in chapter 19 of how they essentially left Judah alone. Uh, Hezekiah was particularly concerned about God's will over anything else. So consider again Jesus' model prayer. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And as your eyes may be glancing there, if you've turned or tapped there, Jesus began with praise, but then what is his first request? What is his first petition? What was it about? Wasn't it about God's will, not ours? And you know the phrase, your kingdom come. Your will be done in heaven as it is on earth, or on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about submission, isn't it? That's submission to God's will entirely. And as Jesus' earthly ministry began, you can see this from the beginning, but now you go back all the way to the end of his earthly ministry, and in the prayer that he uttered in the garden of, what we say, Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 and following, it just says, My Father, if it be possible, what's he referencing? What, you know he's about to reference what we just observed. The Lord's Supper and all that that means about the atoning blood of Christ, the sacrifice of how he was our sin offering and uh, atonement, and ultimately the one who gives new life. So he's, he's saying here, If it be possible, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will, your will be done. So just before the all-important crucifixion, which we are in desperate need of to have atonement for sin, the ability to be sanctified, reconciled to God, he is saying, this is, I want them all to be drawn to you, but if, if this is, it's not the way I want to do it right now. But you know what? More important than that is your will, not mine. And we need that attitude as well. God's will over our own. Then we can start praying a little bit more like the psalmist. To the ultimate praise of God, here is another key point. Let her see. Trust God's answers. Trust God's answers. One sign that we have uh, made prayer more about our will instead of God's is if we get, I hate to say mad at God, but if we struggle with emotions in our relationship with God because we didn't get what we want, then we've made, that's a sign that we've made prayer more about ourselves than God's. Would we not have been more accepting of any answer on any timeline had we sincerely prioritized God's will over ours? Those are good thought questions. If we really believe Romans chapter 8, verse 28, one of my favorite passages, Romans 8, 28, that God is and can and will work everything for the ultimate good for you as a child of Him, then as we seek His will, we will be more trusting and accepting of any answer and steadfast in service no matter what, if we really believe it. Besides, and I do want to reference this as a side note, Matthew chapter 7, God is the perfect Heavenly Father who is loving, and He enjoys giving good gifts to His children. Of course He does, just like any good father does. And who can say that we're good in comparison to God? He's perfect, right? So yes, He does give good gifts, and He does so, so often. 
Those greater gifts, though, are hard to focus on when we are so focused on our requests. Perhaps our focus should be more on how God is giving good things right now to serve for the ultimate purpose of glorifying him best right now. And then as a follow-up of that statement, I will have to say, by encouraging our maturity and growth, perhaps as we mature, greater blessings for his greater glory will come as we grow. So just simply trust him and keep obeying him. Oh, and I have a reference for 2 Corinthians 12. You can read that on your own about the petitions of of Paul three times to have a, a certain thing tended to. And God's answer in that case was no. And there's a lot of reasons why. (laughs) And I think Paul learned this lesson very well from that. So on that note, letter D. Praise God even when the requests are denied. Okay? Even when they are. One of the greatest statements about prayer is in Job chapter 1. Hope you're turning or tapping there. This is, we had a, several years ago, I think Steve taught on 13 weeks on Job. There's so much there to discuss. Chapter 1, verse 21 This is the key phrase. People who aren't even schooled in the scriptures know this phrase pretty well, and and at least it's spinoff. Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, Oftentimes, people take a scripture and reword it. That's fine. Okay. But sometimes that rewording can dilute the intended meaning, and that's where we can need to be careful. Uh, the diluted quip from this goes something like this. I came into this world with nothing, and that's all I'll leave with, too. Now, that's true. But that's not quite as powerful as the message that's found in Job chapter 1 right here. And in the context of the entire book, we know that Job was going through so many trials and was about to. He was never actually told why he went through those trials. We have been told. And also how he was feeling towards his life and towards his death and towards God. All of this adds a mountain of meaning to what he said. And for my purposes today, in this lesson anyway, I'll focus on this golden nugget of potent, powerful truths to consider. Is he not saying... My very life began because of God, and it will end at his hand too. So be it. Praise be to God, no matter what. Wow. Is that our mindset? Sometimes requests, frankly, are denied just to test our love for the Lord. If that be the case, hope we pass the test. If we have the same goal as the psalmists, as with the example of every good and godly person in Scripture, we will also happily bless and praise the name of the Lord and serve Him as they did no matter what. Wow. Prayer then is less about bending God's will to ours, which the power of prayer is incredible. We could go to Moses and examples and talk about this, but but not today, just in daily prayer for us. Prayer is more about bending our will to God's. Thank you for the amen. No matter our requests as well, they are subordinate to this theme of the whole Sunday morning service. Praise be to God. And by the way, here's a question for you. How can we always get our requests? Have you, okay, it's like, what? You're just saying, what if requests were denied? How can we always get our requests? Here's the answer. Pray for what God wants to give. <laughs> want in your heart what God wants. That's the secret. The delight of the Lord is what we want. And he will fill our heart's desire because it's him that we're desiring. And by the way, if God is omniscient, don't you suppose that he knows what's best to glorify his name anyway? Are we in what he is blessing? So on this screen, I just typed out what I was going to say. May we strive to grow in this. May we ever bless the name of God, whether he gives or takes away. May we praise God. God, because he is worthy, and may we humble ourselves before him and surrender both our life and all of our prayers for this particular purpose, beginning and ending with praise. If you haven't been in the habit of doing this, I encourage you to do this this week, and it'll change your life and relationship with Christ. It always is about that relationship with Christ. Our primary question today is, how is your relationship with God? 
how can your relationship with him be immeasurably enhanced? Well, here's how we do it. By humbling ourselves before him and respond to that gospel in faith that lends itself to action and a changed life of obedience. That's the biblical plan for a transformed life. It's at the cross and by our response to the gospel that allows us by faith to contact the blood at that cross by the sinless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, God in flesh himself, that atone for our sin, making it possible for us to be reconciled to him. Forgiveness of sin, new status as a child of his, eternal life, and get this, eternal life as a gracious reward, gracious reward for simply faithfully following him. If you have not responded to the gospel that puts you in Christ to have access to all these blessings that help fulfill the purpose of your life, praise to God. Let's make this happen.